Mr. Murphy, good old Murphy died. Mrs. Murphy went to the local newspaper to take out an obituary, and she said, how much? And the newspaper publisher said, $5 a word. So she scribbled on a piece of paper, Murphy died, and gave him 10 bucks. And the newspaper editor, the publisher saying, sensing an opportunity, and these obviously being tough times for newspapers, said, yeah, it's $5 a word, but there's a five word minimum. So she thought for a moment, and she said, okay, Murphy died, Volkswagen for sale. <laughs> now, I love to tell that story in part because it's funny, but, but also there's a great lesson in it, which is that you can, anything that you can say, you can probably say simpler. And we have a tendency to, to take complicated matters and make them more complicated rather than simpler and certainly more, uh, more complicated than they ought to be if we want to communicate these important lessons about health. And I was really inspired yesterday by Thomas Goetz, not to reference another journalist, but, but his story about reimagining the standard lab report and something as simple as simplifying this object that we all take for granted can have such enormous payout. So, so I thought that I would try uh, to, to take a stab at clarifying and hopefully simplifying something that's really germane to all of these discussions, which is the burden of disease. And I want to talk with that first slide. Oh, I don't even have a clicker here. Yeah, thanks. The first sl slide, which is basically, you know, what is the burden of cancer? You know, what is the burden of any disease, we can ask, but for now, let's just focus on the burden of cancer. And when we think about everything that goes into it, there are a lot of definitions, most of which do not agree with each other in terms of the published, you know, what the official definition of a, of a disease burden is. But mostly they think about incidence and mortality, you know, the th you know, new cases and how many people are dying, which makes sense. We think about how many people are getting the disease and how many people are dying. That's intuitive. Also within that, and this is the, I guess, the closest thing you can get to an official definition, you know, the financial, emotional, sex, and uh, social and spiritual, you might throw in there, the cost, the impact of the disease on people. We don't often think about those things, but they all go into what you might call the cancer burden. In fact, if you're thinking about you know, what it's like to have a disease, the things you think about are waiting for two hours in the clinic or waiting for your blood work to come back or the, uh, you know, horrible feeling about waiting for, uh, you know, for that conversation with a doctor that you fear. Or it's caretaking. Caretaking is an enormous part of the, of the, of the cancer burden and, and other disease burdens. And so what we want to do is we want to throw all these things into a big ball, into a sphere, and imagine this as our burden. This is what we want. And when we're asking the question about whether we're going to make, whether we're making progress in the war on cancer or not, or the war on anything, we want to know a simple thing. Is that burden reduced from where it was? Is it, has it gotten smaller? Is it less onerous? Is it, is it less taxing? Have we made progress in reducing that burden? And that is the fundamental question that often gets, has become made more opaque uh, and made more, less intuitive and more difficult to understand when it's addressed by many people in the cancer community. And so let's take this first issue about cancer mortality. Are more people dying of the disease? It's a simple question. Uh, the, some people, when you're talking about cancer burden, don't actually include mortality. They, but, but this is, for now, we're going, to, we're going to deal with it. So are more people dying with a disease? And what you'll find from the official answer is, this is the latest, or not the latest numbers, but basically the numbers are going down. That's what the death rate is going down. And you've heard this story lots and lots of times, probably. This is from 2007, an NCI report. Uh, I'm sorry, American Cancer Society and NCI report. And uh, since then, this has been updated again and again. And this is the message that you hear. And this is how it gets get told from the American Cancer Society. Measurable, inspiring numbers. So this is not a little. This is a lot. This is what we're led to believe. And the National Cancer Institute celebrated this idea that the rate 
of decline was doubling. So here's how it gets played out. You can see that newspapers and media outlets around the country really celebrated this decline in death rate. And this has been a real mark of our progress. Uh, whether it's the Washington Post or the New York Post. I actually love the New York Post one because it, it reads like a haiku if you read that headline. It's winning war on cancer, death rates plummet, snowflakes falling on water or something. And you can just finish it, you know. And the NPR one is interesting because it translates death rates, declining death rates, into something else, deaths. We've lost all the rates. So the, as this gets passed through the filter from, from the excitement of epidemiologists and biostatisticians down through the institutional you know, websites and eventually to, through the media and to us, we get this impression that deaths are going down. Now, here's the rub, because what these rates are doing is not measuring burden not measuring that stuff in the big ball that we saw in front. They're measuring something else. They're measuring the weighted average of the age-specific risk of death if all of that were skewed to a particular standardized population. And there's the definition for you there. That's what they're measuring. And what's important uh, is to think, it helps to think about Florida when you're trying to explain this, and this may be the only time you can say it helps to think about Florida, but... Um, <laughs> but so here you have a population of 18 and a half million, and you've got 40-something deaths from cancer. That's a huge number. It's a huge number, and if you work it out as a crude rate, it's actually, you know, much higher than the national average. And here, if we compare it to Texas, and uh, you may recognize this guy. You got clobbered last night. I put him in there because... Cliff Lee is absolutely destroying my Google instant ranking, and, uh, and it's very frustrating. Every time I search for myself, I'm down. Anyway, um, so you can see that he has, uh, Texas has a lot, uh, 6 million more people and 5,000 fewer cancer deaths a year. So what's going on? Well, there's an obvious answer, as we all know, um, and you know uh, that answer is radioactive Mickey Mouse, and so that's pretty much what has caused, <laughs> caused the problem in Florida. No, really seriously, the answer is this, is that the population of people 65 and older in Florida is 17.2% as of 2009, compared with very young Texas. That, they're different countries. And so how on earth could we possibly, possibly compare these two? Because here we have the fundamental chart here that I'm going to show you today is a chart of risk. Age, this is, the, this is the biggest risk factor in cancer, when you think about it. It's bigger than tobacco. It's bigger than bleach flour. It's bigger than eating a nitrate-filled hot dog while smoking and eating bleach flour. Uh, it's bigger than all of them. This the process of aging is so intricately woven with the process of cancer. The accumulation of genetic defect over time is so intricately woven with the process of cancer that with each day, we have more, more of our cells divide, and with each of those episodes, there's a chance for a mishap, a genetic mishap that maybe years from now or decades from now with other mishaps, can set the stage for an invasive cancer. And so aging is a fundamental part of this. And so what we want to do is, is when we're comparing Florida and Texas, we want to figure out some way to compare them. So in 1844, this ingenious statistical construct called the standardized population was invented. And in 1844, by the way, Florida maybe had half a dozen strip malls. That's it. That's how old it was. But in 1844, the idea of taking two different populations with different age distributions, different population period, pyramids, and pretending that they would all fit in the same standard so that you could say, it's just a mind game. You know, it's just a construct. So you could take their age-specific rates for, for their various diseases in, in you know, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 11 to 14, and all the way up to 85 and over. And then pretend that the proportion, 
multiply them by a factor that represented the proportion in the standardized population, and then you'd be comparing apples to apples, because you'd be filtering out this great, what they call a confounder, a great, um, uh, so, so here's what you can do with that. You take the age-adjusted death rate, um, and you can see that African Americans have a substantially higher rate of death than white Americans do age for age. Now, this doesn't tell us what we can do about it, but it tells us that there's a problem. The other thing we can do is we can see cancer clusters. Now, cancer people hate, you know, when you mention the word clusters. But you can see outlier examples of, 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 of disease or death in a specific area. And up in the uh, up in this corner of the Northern Plains area, for half a century, we've seen an outlier rate of prostate cancer mortality in white males. Okay, it's a strange thing. Again, we can't really do anything about it with age adjusted. But the problem is, the problem is, is when we're looking to compare burden over time, the thing that we're filtering out now, age, is the main driver of the burden. It's the thing we don't want to filter out. It tells us about the real world. It's filtering it out, it's like filtering out smoking, you know, from our calculation, or it's filtering out obesity, as we saw all these charts from, from um, over, the, over the conference about how the obesity rate has changed. Let's pretend that hasn't changed. And so the, the challenge is to remember that the age-adjusted rate that you're hearing about is not a, a, a measure of anything real. And the statistical primers at the National Center for Health Statistics, this, this is the group that actually collects and collates and, and, are, are, and is the arbiter of our health statistics, they have directive after directive telling you do not confuse this with burden. And yet, people do it all the time because that's how it gets translated through the media um, that we're making progress by reducing the rate of disease. People think that's the actual frequency of disease rather than a comparative rate of death. Um, so this is another primer that says this. Now the, the challenge is to see what we're missing. Okay, and here's what we're missing. Let's simplify this as much as we possibly can and say, just count deaths. And here on the red line, you see deaths from cancer every year uh, from 1971 and compared with deaths from heart disease. And you can see that we're going in two different directions. But look at this chart and you can see that virtually every cause of death with the exception of cancer and diabetes, every leading cause of death in 1971 went down in terms of crude rate, which is as a percentage of the population, but many of them in raw numbers, too. If you look here at this, uh, next slide, oh, there we go. Um, this figure here, it's 100,000 fewer deaths from heart disease. Now, consider that there are 96 million more people. That's 96 million more hearts thumping and bumping and sitting in the DMV and commuting and running for airplanes. 96 million more Americans, and yet 100,000 fewer heart disease deaths. If you look at stroke, it's something like uh, 70,000 fewer deaths and the, and the death rate is halved. If you look at car accidents, which is a really amazing figure because it's not just 96 million more people, it's 137 million more vehicles on the road in that time. Road rage entered our lexicon during all this time. You know, we drive faster, we, we text and drive, uh, we spill lattes on ourselves and still 8,000 fewer deaths from motor vehicle accidents during this time. And the, the syllogism that says it all, in fact, is that if you take everything from 1971, every cause of death apart from cancer, and look at that, that crude rate has dropped 19%. Everything except cancer. Cancer, meanwhile, has risen about 15% in the crude rate. So this is what it tells us. And you can see here's an NCI chart. And the red lines are the reduction in risk. The blue lines are the increase in numbers. This is what we do. And the place that says it better than anything else in the world is breast cancer. Because here we put more of our resources, more of our money, more of our passion, more of our marching and, and dancing and walking to try to find a cure. And here's where we are. Just look at the crude rate, this number right here at the bottom, this 5.3. That's, that's a little improvement. But when you're thinking about 
the effort that we've gotten in this one disease over 35, 36 years to reduce the, the rate, the real rate of disease in the real world, that's not very much. It's still 40,000 plus women a year dying of this disease. What about cancer incidence? Well, that's going up. And here, this chart says it all. The blue lines are the annual numbers per cases. The red line is the percentage growth. It's nearly three times faster than the population. There's a cost to this, a human cost. For a, here's the crude rate. And you can see every, all of the treatment um, it comes with a cost, a human cost. But it also comes with a financial cost. And, and here you can see this is the, the, the numbers of people getting breast cancer. We've done absolutely nothing to reduce the number of people getting the disease. So every one of these women plus another 70,000 with in situ disease will have to go through some form of treatment. And some of that treatment may be over treatment and some of it may, uh, may end up with long-term side effects and all of that is part of the burden. Throw that in the bowl, right? Finally, we have the cost, the financial costs. And I'm only gonna leave you with two slides because I've run out of time, but this is, again, NCI numbers, and you can see the growth rate here in the cost from 1963 to the latest numbers. Um, again, NCI and American Cancer Society numbers. And since they're nominal, that's not adjusted for inflation, I wanted to compare it with something. So I thought I would compare it with this. Here's our runaway national debt. Thank you. Yeah.